Hello, thanks for having me here tonight to talk about the Wild Oysters Project. I'm Ashley, I'm a marine ecologist and I've been studying the Northeast's marine environment for over 10 years now, having first studied here as a student and then working as a researcher at Newcastle University. But I've recently gotten involved in a new project in Tyne and Weir called the Wild Oysters Project, which is all about oyster restoration. So tonight I'm going to talk about some of the background of oysters and why they're an important part of the marine ecosystem before talking about what our plans are to help protect and recover this species in UK waters. So oysters are sessile bivalve mollusks, which means that they don't move once they're settled on the seabed and they have a hinge shell which opens and closes. There are almost 30 species of oysters worldwide, but here in the UK we see mainly two species, which are the native oyster, also called the flat oyster or European oyster, and then the Pacific oyster, which is an invasive non-native species found in UK waters. And unfortunately, it's established in a couple of locations, including Cornwall and Devon. And the native oyster is typically associated with shallow subtidal coastal and estuarine habitats, but there are also offshore populations in deeper waters up to about 80 metres. So in the wild, healthy populations of oysters form dense aggregations called oyster reefs. And this is when oysters stick together, attaching themselves to other living oysters and also old shells. So you can see here some nice examples of oyster reefs in France and how they can really create these complex 3D structures on the seabed. And this is why oysters can be classified as ecosystem engineers, because of this habitat creation and modification. And oysters and oyster reefs also deliver countless ecosystem services, which are nicely summarised in this infographic. I'll not go through all of them, but I'll focus on two of my favourites, which are water quality and biodiversity. So you can see in this time lapse video how effective oysters are at cleaning water. So the tank on the left is empty and the tank on the right contains native oyster, which clears the water in just a few hours. This is because oysters are filter feeders, so they filter seawater to extract suspended particles. But this feeding action also improves water clarity and turbidity, which is beneficial for other species that like like to grow, such as macroalgae or seagrass, and also water quality can be improved by the removal of excess nutrients like nitrogen from the water. And a single oyster can filter over 200 litres of water a day. And so imagine what a whole reef could do. It can result in significant water quality improvements at the local scale. And then the boost to local biodiversity that oyster reefs provide is enormous. And there are two major mechanisms for this. First, the oyster shells themselves provide a hard substrate that attracts epifauna. And epifauna are living things living on another living thing. So these are things like sponges, bryozoans, macroalgae, sea squirts, basically those encrusting and sessile species. And you can see this really nicely in these images, especially the bottom two here. In the bottom right, in fact, you can barely see the oyster unless you're really looking for it. It's so heavily encrusted. And then the second me mechanism for the biodiversity boost is the 3D habitat that the reefs create. And the gaps and crevices in between the oysters in the reef creates another microhabitat providing shelter. And these spaces are great for smaller mobile species like crabs and small fish. And because of this, oyster reefs can act as nursery grounds for juvenile fish, including commercially important species. And I couldn't not include these photos too, which were recently crowned winner and runner-up of the Native Oyster Photo Competition run by the Native Oyster Network. The left was taken in Brighton Marina, where the oysters were found attached to the pontoons covered by a diverse faunal turf and surrounded by lots of sea squirts and sponges and hydroids. And the right was snapped at Brighton Pier. And here the oyster shell is covered in a bright yellow sponge and right next to a bed of mussels, another amazing filter feeding marine bivalve. And these images really show how, how diverse and full of life oyster reefs can be. So hopefully now you're convinced about how good oysters are for the environment. Um, but unfortunately now we have to talk about the state of, status of the native oyster. And populations have declined by over 95% in the UK since the mid 19th century, with oyster reefs now being regarded as a nationally scarce habitat and one of the most threatened marine habitats in Europe.
they are on their path to extinction if nothing is done to help them. And there are multiple drivers of these declines, including overfishing, disease, pollution, habitat loss, and the appearance of competitive and predatory invasive species. And although some of these drivers have since ceased, native oysters have struggled to recover without human intervention. And this can become, come down to two major barriers to recovery. The first is the lack of brood stock in the wild left to effectively reproduce. In most places, there aren't enough oysters left in the wild in dense enough ag aggregations to produce enough offspring to grow their populations. And the second is the lack of suitable habitat for oysters. So the way oysters are fished by dredging the seabed means that when oysters are removed, so is a lot of the habitat that they rely on. And oysters are known to be very fussy. And when the larvae are attracted to settle on the substrate, they look for some calcium carbonate content, which their own shells have. So they prefer to settle on mixed substrate that contains shells. And there just isn't much of this habitat left around the UK. And that's where the Wild Oysters Project comes in. Along with other restoration schemes around the UK, we are helping to overcome these barriers to oyster recovery. So this project is a new national partnership between the Zoological Society of London, Blue Marine Foundation and British Marine. And each partner brings a different specialism and experience, which overlap nicely to deliver a project based on oyster restoration in the context of marine policy and engagement. And this work is funded by the players of the People's Postcode Lottery through the Dream Fund. So the project is working across England, Scotland and Wales with an oyster rehabilitation hub in each country. And at each location, the hubs are run by local delivery partners who bring the local knowledge and contacts to the project. So the overall aim or mission statement of the project is that the UK seas have self-sustaining populations of native oyster, which provide clean water, healthy fisheries, plentiful biodiversity, and on land, there is a reignited national love of this iconic species. And the project will take a three-pronged approach to oyster restoration, made up of first reintroducing adult oysters in the form of oyster nurseries in coastal waters, then restoring oyster habitat to encourage the creation of oyster reefs further into the subtidal zone. And last but not least, spreading the word through public engagement, education and citizen science. And the project aligns perfectly with the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which kicks off this year. And we're really excited to join the global movement to reverse the degradation of ecosystems. So now that I've given a bit of background and introduced the project at the national scale, we can now dig a bit deeper into what we're doing here specifically in Northeast England. So the Tynamia Oyster Rehabilitation Hub is being delivered locally by Groundwork Northeast and Cumbria and the Environment Agency. And I'm the local project officer based here. So we are working in two local estuaries and along the inshore waters in between these two sites. So here in the northeast England, we don't have any oyster reefs left at all, which means we are really starting from scratch in the Tyne Weir Hub, which I think is a really exciting opportunity with the potential to have an even greater impact. And you can see from the distribution map on the left that oysters are generally um, distributed in the south of the UK. But something that first flagged the northeast coast as a good area for oyster restoration was the Environment Agency's native oyster bed potential spatial model. You can see the output on the right has highlighted quite a few locations along the northeast coast that they think would be a suitable um, site for restoration activity. And we do know that they were once common around the whole of Britain. And this map from, 1980, from 1883 shows where fishermen reported there were oyster reefs in the North Sea. And hopefully you can see the thin line of orange all the way down the northeast coast there, suggesting that we once had really extensive coastal oyster reefs here. And it also suggests that they would be able to live here again, given the right conditions. <laughs> 
And then there's also the local cultural history to think about as well. So it seems that oysters were once a significant part of Tyne and Weir culture too. So you might have heard of a street in Newcastle called Oystershell Road, and it was actually named after a house that stood on the site up until the 1850s called Oystershell Hall. And it was basically a house that was fully rendered from top to toe in oyster shells. And then there's also oyster, uh, records of oyster saloons and fish markets specialising in just oysters locally. So we do know that oysters once formed a significant part of local culture and we do hope to bring that back in some way alongside the ecological benefits. So back to the three pronged approach, which I was talking about to overcome the barriers to oyster recovery. I'm going to go into each one in a bit more detail specific to the northeast sites. So we'll shortly be installing 47 oyster nurseries into local estuary sites, and these nurseries will house over 1200 mature adult oysters. And they will be suspended just under the water's surface attached to man-made structures. And over the next three years, it's predicted that these oysters will spawn inside the nurseries and release over 3 billion larvae into northeast England waters, essentially seeding the sea. And this is the first step to overcoming the lack of broodstock. But then now that the larvae is in the water, we still need to encourage them to settle and grow onto the seabed. So the next phase is the habitat restoration. And we're currently working on gathering local data to enable us to select the most suitable location offshore to sustain oyster populations in the long term. And there are lots of factors to consider, including fishing pressure, offshore cables, the flow speed of the water and the substrate type. And if we decide it's necessary, we will be able to add oyster shells to the seabed in a location that we feel is the most suitable to make sure that the preferred substrate type with that calcium carbonate content is present and therefore the oyster larvae can settle and to the seabed and grow to create the reefs. And the final phase is education and outreach with the aim of increasing people's understanding and bringing the cultural value of oysters back into people's lives. In Tyne and Weir we aim to engage with over 15,000 people including 4,000 students. We've been working with London Zoo to develop materials that contain multiple curriculum links and it looks like for the time being most of the engagement will be remote but we hope that in the not too distant future we'll be able to deliver face-to-face -face activities like marina visits where the children can see the oysters up close um, and feel them and help us to monitor the nurseries. We're also planning events over the course of the project to include more of the local coastal communities and our Oyster nurseries have a second role as the stars of our outreach program as well. So they act as a window into the ocean as we can remove them from the water so people can see them up close on dry land. And we will also be collecting video footage of the biodiversity underwater. I have an example of that from the Solent here. So this is some footage collected at the oyster nurseries in the Solent as part of the Solent Oyster Restoration Project. And you can see that the cage structure and the oysters provide habitat for lots of encrusting species. So you've got sea squirts and bryozoans, hydroids, sponges. And then you also start to see some of the mobile species like small juvenile fish which might use the nurseries for shelter and feeding. And then you also get these larger species of fish like the sea bass seen here, um, which use these areas for feeding also. So you can see that the nurseries themselves create really diverse communities in and amongst these man-made surfaces, which is a great extra benefit. And then we'll also be carrying out extensive monitoring of the nurseries and the reef sites throughout the project. So for our nursery monitoring, we're hoping to recruit some citizen scientists to help us collect data on oyster survival and breeding and the associated mobile species with net surveys and the sessile species attached to the oysters and the nursery structures. 
and these will be monthly surveys at each site and we plan to combine these with remote surveys with underwater imagery and also imagery close-ups of the shells. In terms of the project timeline, the project is running from summer 2020 to 2023 and we do hope that the project will have a lasting legacy and that the nurseries and reefs will continue to be cared for and monitored after this time. So our oyster nurseries were installed last month in January, so they're ready for our oysters to be added very soon this month. And we will be carrying out baseline surveys for the potential reef sites in the spring this year, followed by seabed restoration in the summer. And then the monitoring and outreach is an ongoing factor continuing throughout the entire project. So we're hoping that you might want to get involved in the project. You can sign up to volunteer to collect monitoring data with us. Um, you can also link us up with interested community groups and schools that you think might be interested in engaging. And finally, you can follow us and our journey on social media to keep up with the restoration progress. We have a public Twitter and Instagram account accounts and also a private Facebook for volunteers. So if you are interested in getting involved, please get in touch at the email here, wild.oysters at zsl.org. And then also please add Tyne and Weir into the subject line so that it makes its way to me here in the Northeast. So that's all from me and thanks for listening and thanks so much for, to the Natural History Society of Northumbria for having me along to talk oysters. Thanks.